everyone. Welcome to Beta Talk, a podcast I do all about uh, energy, renewable energy mainly, and uh, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, and all the others. Uh, you can also find it on YouTube now, and it's under Beta Teach. So please subscribe. Please also uh, give it a rating on your on your Spotify or iTunes because apparently that helps other people uh, find it. Now I'm joined today by three guests. We're going to be talking about district heating, heat networks. I'm joined by Dr. Ingo Luzbrock, who's the head of department at Cities and Networks, uh, AEE Intech, and we'll obviously talk a little bit more about what they do. They're a non-profit research institute in Austria, research in energy and resource efficiency. And they've got a strong focus on thermal side of things and my favourite, solar thermal energy. We're also joined by David Watson, who's the Managing Director of the Heat Trust, which is a non-profit consumer champion for those on heat networks. He's been working in energy policy for over 20 years and uh, was recently the Director of Group Strategy at Centrica, where he worked on the decarbonisation of heat policy. And David and I sort of chat quite a bit on, uh, on, on our social media channels. And I'm also joined, uh, you're recognising by my good friend, Paul Hull, who's the Managing Director of the Commercia Group. He's also the Campaign Director for Gas Safe Superheroes. He's one of my sort of favourite uh, commercial entities, one of the top entities in the country. So he's, uh, he's going to be joining us too. So we're going to get straight to it. Um, I'm going to just uh, close down <laughs> something here on my computer. Paul. You work on a lot of uh, district heat or heat networks. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you ever come across uh, heat networks that have got solar thermal energy going into them? Well, it's not going to be a very popular answer, but no. <laughs> <laughs> and, why, and why do you think that is? Um, well, obviously, a lot of our older district systems are, are at least 50 years old, aren't they? I suppose it was never thought of and it's never been looked at as a to be added on as an extra even when the board house is getting redone and that it just it, it, I never see it on the tender, never been asked for it. So it was, um we were a little bit behind the times as I said. Uh, David you're, you're you're involved in policy. Um what's the sort of what sort of the is there much discourse around heat networks going on at the moment? Yeah, it really is actually. I think this is like it feels like we're on the cusp of a golden age. I think that generally people can see the role that heat networks is going to play within the decarbonisation of heat. We're starting to see government come forward with policy, whether it's in terms of funding. We're talking about the um, what customer protection might look like. We might get into that a little bit later. Like it, it feels like it's a it's a topic. Things are happening. And um, it's the sectors being set up for growth over the over the next over the next ten years plus to, to deliver what it what it can in terms of low carbon heat. I mean, are, are there particular cities that seem more interested than the others around this sort of uh, way of heating? Up? It's a bit of a mix, actually. So the um, the people that I'm speaking to, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ambitions from cities, and they've got a lot of cash and a lot of um, ambition uh, to to go early in a number of cases on decarbonisation of heat. There's a number of cities I call out, for example, like London, and a lot a lot going on there. Bristol, there's, another, there's a lot going on there. Nottingham, the dots are all over the country. I don't think it's just cities, though, Nathan. Um, I also, pick, I mean, there's a lot of developers that are interested in this. So particularly as we start moving towards 2025 and the, the, the ban on um, new gas connections, developers are increasingly looking at heat networks and that's, you know, that's the, the likes of the people that are building housing estates up and down the country and I'm aware that there's an increasing number of these developments going in right now actually. Bingo, I, I see to... quite a lot of this Nathan, yeah, mm. on, um, on some, we, we was at a development which was two years old in um, East London, um, um, when was it, last week we was there, the gas borders had gone in the basement but they got a roof for the thermal on the roof. It's all been disconnected. Doesn't work. You're putting badly. I did say to him, if you want to have a look at trying to get this back up and running, to Paul, it was never special. There's, there's a whole roof full of it, literally full of it. Big muffy, massive buffer tank in the basement, all been disconnected. Two years old. That's such a shame. I mean, you and I do actually chat about this a lot. I mean, you go in an awful lot of plant rooms all the way up to sort of yeah, yeah. estate buildings and you see, unfortunately, some of these even new plant rooms, they're just not working efficiently at all, are they? No, not at all. And, uh, and all the biomass boilers are put in, none of them work correctly. All just discommissioned, just all set, they're doing nothing. 
Mm. It looks like, like, to me, Nathan, being an old time engineer, a lot of it's been a textbook exercise to get past the planning permission. And that might be a bit controversial, but that, that's mm. what it looks like to me. A lot of it. It's never going to work. I mean, we, we, I, we even see this in the, I mean, I, I, I'll announce it actually today. We just started something called the Killer Kilowatt campaign, which is where most condensing boilers installed domestically aren't actually condensing. So they're only running about 80% efficient. Mm. And mm. it's just a simple matter of turning your flow down to 60 degrees so you get your return temperature around 40 so they go into f proper condensing mode. Because coming out of the factory, these boilers flow are set too high where they actually aren't condensing. I mean, so obviously in the commercial sector, like what you're, what you're mainly involved in, you're going into these part rooms, brand new spanking gear, but often not commissioned properly, not even working then sometimes. Sorry, Paul. Go on. No, I was about to say, I think, so obviously, as you said, Nathan, we act as the, the customer champion for people on heat networks, and it's the customers that end up with a lot of the problems on this, because you get um, you get heat networks that have been put in historically, where maybe the incentives between the developer and the, the energy service company off the back of it are misaligned, and you get either poor design or poor efficiency or poor reliability, and it kind of gives heat networks a bad name. Mm. I'd say I think the, the minority of heat networks, I think the majority of heat networks really do provide like clean, reliable, cheap heat. But there are there are some really bad examples out there. And I think when we get onto what this means for regulation and policy moving forward, we do really need to think about how do we ensure that the, the technical standards are, are right at the, at, the, at the first point and the design and the build of these things. Yeah, because I mean, there are amazing things. Uh, uh, and I'm going to bring you in, Ingo, because you uh, just explain a little bit about what you do. So what we do here in uh, our institute, our, in our projects is really getting district heating going uh, all over Europe. We've got quite a tradition here in Austria, let's say for the last 30, 40 years on biomass district heating systems coming up also in smaller towns, starting from a couple of hundred kilowatts with a few connections up to the larger cities with Vienna being being quite a monster of a system with thousands of connections, a huge uh, portfolio of supply units from gas to whatsoever. So uh, you find something like three and a half thousand systems, district heating systems just all over Austria, all over small ones, medium ones, uh, large scale ones. So we, we try to get them even better than they already are, optimize them, uh, try to kick out uh, as far as possible gas and then and other fossil fuels that are in. Uh, gas is definitely technically a brilliant thing to have from, from just a technical point of view, but, but uh, getting it out is somewhere the ultimate goal of everybody. Uh, that's nevertheless quite a challenge for all of us, independent where you are. And on the other hand, what we really try to do is get not only the technical part done, but also the planning part. So what, what you just said, David, try to align, let's say, the city development and urban development with the ideas of the energy service provider with the needs of, of the developer and the tenants. And, and this is not just technical stuff, simulations or modeling. This is also just stakeholder integration, talking a lot, getting things transparent. Like, like you have said, David, as well, if there's one bad example somewhere popping up, everything gets a bad name. Yeah. And something what you have to avoid. And if something is really go has gone wrong one time, you have to spend 10 times the effort to get it basically back to the same level as before. So both things are really important for us. So the technical part, getting things better, optimize them, getting, let's say, waste heat better integrated, having small scale storage, large scale storage, having the buildings being flexible on the other side, the planning part, the economics, and then and, and also having good business models and contracts. So Paul, you're both involved. Things. You're, you're in, when some of these systems actually sort of get planned and then, and then implemented, you're, you're involved at that sort of process where um, M&E consultants come in and is that sometimes where it all goes a little bit wrong? Um, for, for <laughs> how, how much time Careful. do we <laughs> Yes. Now, usually what we try to do is to, to, to start the concept development uh, till the point when it goes to basic and detailed engineering. So what we do then, we say, okay, this is not our part anymore. We try to support them, the detail engineering and the basic engineering, also later on the monitoring and the operation. Uh, but there are a lot of things that might go wrong in the whole process anyway, from starting from a concept to, to having something 
uh, really being operational uh, after a couple of years most often. So where it goes most often wrong is, uh, not wrong, but, but what's really a deal breaker are the economics most often. Simply saying that uh, if you try to kick out gas nowadays, uh, if, you, if you just see the, the price that the large scale suppliers pay for, for, for the megawatt hour of gas versus something, let's say solar thermal, uh, just on pure economics without having any, any CO2 taxes going on, it's a no brainer for them. This won't cost a third of, 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 of the solar thermal or biomass or whatsoever. Where are the big solar thermal heat networks? I mean, I'm imagining in sort of Denmark, there's some big ones, isn't there? You have got the main ones are in Denmark. You've got uh, Silkeborg with something like, uh, what is it, 160,000 square meters uh, in combination with some, some tank storage, of course, because uh, such a large field you don't build without any seasonal storage. And then I think it's, it's Voyance that has 70,000, 75,000 and a couple of others in that range, 50,000, 60,000 in, 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 in Denmark, definitely. There are some larger ones in Germany, also in Austria, in the range, let's say, between 2,000 and, let's say, 10,000, uh, mainly then for, for smaller networks and just being in addition to, to other energy sources, biomass, gas, or whatsoever. And you've got also smaller units in a couple of hundred square meters, like we have in Gleisdorf, we've got three of them supporting our local network. They are just on the roofs of, let's say, uh, the hospital, a supermarket, where you've got a couple of square meters not used for, for ventilation or whatever else on the roof or for PV yet. David, in your sort of uh, time within policy, I mean, I, I'm, I'm well known for sort of saying that we don't um, have solar thermal very much in the discourses at the moment around energy. I mean, do, do, do you hear much? Of, I mean, because obviously, as, as Paul and I know, so, solar thermal going into buffer tanks to help uh, heat um, these district heating systems, it's, it's, it's just, you know, if I walk outside this door now, I'm getting warm because of free energy, the sun, that infrared energy, and we can use that, we can capture this. And uh, I mean, is anything, do you hear about it much in the discourses that you're involved in? No, I don't mean to offend you, Nathan. I don't. I don't hear much. I mean, I'm not sort of involved in in policy uh, that much these days. But um, it's just it just seems to be it doesn't get talked about. And I don't know whether that's because people think, well, this is a sort of a, a proven technology that doesn't need policy intervention. Maybe they're looking at how we can support maybe less commercial technologies, or whether it's just not understood. I, I don't know what the real barrier is. But I think, as you said, it has a role to play. I, I know, think I know the answer there. Go on, Paul. Um, I'll let you be cynical. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit controversial. It's coming up. Uh, unfortunately, solar thermal domestically has got a very, very bad name in the UK. Yeah, there was a lot of bad installers. A lot mm. of them, it sort of become the new double glazing fiasco of the 70s it, yeah, and 80s. A lot of these systems are put in, harder than ever work. And the payback on a system is roughly about £50 a year, how those put in. So, I think that's why government, they're not even, what I understand and what I talk to, they're not even considering it at the moment. That's a shame, isn't it? So, I mean, whereas in Europe, I mean, they, they really understand the potential of solar thermal all the way from domestic, all the way up to these great big yeah. heat networks. But it's, I mean, you know, I sit in that low carbon standard forum that it's not even being talked about, mate. It's not even, it's not even on the agenda. Mm. Mm. And Going back to consumers, David, and obviously that's what uh, the, the heat um, your, 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 your organisation does. I mean, do, do the consumers have sort of some sort of forum where they can chat about this or how, how do you interact with them? So we deal with the people that are party to our scheme are the, are the organisations that interface with the customers. So it's, it's the, the major heat network providers. And the way we provide customer assurance is we, we set minimum standards of customer protection through the heat trust scheme which um, we then hold those providers to account for. And that, that ensures that, for example, that customers are getting a clear and transparent bill, that they're protected when there's disconnection procedures, that there's a due process going through, that the support for vulnerable customers, for example. It's the sort of protections that if you're in the regulated market, you sort of come and take for granted through the, uh, regulation of off-gem. But it, before the heat trust existed, it didn't exist for customers in the heat network. Mm -hmm. And I think for just what you said there, Paul, I think the reason why that's important is because if you do get bad installations, or you do get a bad customer, 
customer experience, it can kill the growth in the sector like right from word on. So it sounds to me, from what you're saying there, Paul, that we had some issues in the solar thermal market some years ago, and that decades later, it's still off the agenda. I think for, for me, I really believe in the, the role that heat networks have got to play, but in order for that fleet networks to realise that, we need to get it right, and that means starting from the customer, ensuring that heat networks are providing safe, reliable, clean energy for those customers. Because then it gives the, it gives the license for the, the sector to then go into the ground. A question on the domestic solar thermal. Is there any kind of certification or quality management program in the UK on that? So really making sure that if somebody's putting something on your roof, it has to work to a certain, let's say, efficiency, or is it just... Uh... Well, uh, you've engendered <laughs> No, it was the answer, isn't it? <laughs> you've engendered hey, another thank topic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm well because... known for inculcating that in this country, we teach people to be qualified, which is a lot different than teaching them to be competent. There's a huge difference. <laughs> yes. Um, in this industry, you can get qualified quite easy. You have certification schemes. Uh, sometimes some of the schemes are basically there so you can get like the renewable heat incentives, for instance, you have to be MCS accredited to pull down on that. Uh, mm. I've been speaking to some companies re recently and you know they, they use a lot of MCS engineers and there's a disparity between who's good and who's not. Uh, that's not knocking MCS, of course, because obviously they used to sponsor mm. this show. But there's, 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 I'll be doing a lot of stuff about the, uh, the sort of qualification side of it uh, in other other episodes i was going to talk to david about is there any sort of manufacturers uh and paul you'd be good for this as well that are really involved with it i know my friends at kenza so i'm very good friends with kenza and i know they get involved with some they got some very interesting stuff because obviously as paul would know usually, usually a district heating system is running around hot water around the place you can lose a lot of energy it then comes to heat interface units whereas kenza have a different system they run the ground loop around and then it comes to these little, what they call shoe boxes. It uses refrigeration technology and it heats individual uh, dwellings. Uh, do, do, I mean, do, do you interact with any of the manufacturers at all or, or, around this? I mean, they're not part of our scheme. So like we're specifically there for the customer and things, but I speak to some of the manufacturers about their interests and obviously like most spoke about some of the technical standards and how that can feed through to customers. I think there's a real variety of technology out there, particularly as we look to decarbonize it. And you've got some major players there. So, I mean, it's all, all, the, all the manufacturers of large heat pumps, for example, you've got people involved in gas CHPs and other turbines. Like, I mean, like the likes of Siemens, for example, mm. you've got organizations such as, um, like Vattenfall and Uniper, for example, European country, uh, company. They're involved in the engineering of it, all the way down to some of the smaller organizations like you just mentioned there. Mm. Well, what, I, mean, what, I really I think that with, with the district heat system in the future, we've got to look at hybrid systems. So it's not going to be just yeah. one heat source. It's got to be, you've got to have solar, we've got to have heat pumps. I still think gas is, especially in, in some of these larger, I still think yeah. gas has got maybe the last top up. I think there's still a place to, Biomass, I don't really, I'm really not convinced in the UK. In the UK um, yeah. the, the, these systems have got to be hybrid. We've got yeah. to be using multi fuel, multi zone, and control properly and, yeah. and controls by controls that people can use. Yeah. Now, to say something, like, I like to think I'm average intelligence. Some of these things, I think, like the winner of Mastermind who actually struggled to program these things, yeah. And you've got to hand these things over to an end user. So we need mm. easy user controls, yeah, mm. that people can. So you, you don't have to go to your controls company and pay 850 quid for somebody to come out, plug it into a laptop. You've got, it's got to be access for everybody, yeah? Mm. That's another big bugbear of mine in the industry. But we need easy controls so you can get these multi-fields work, working and talking together. And Because it's got to be better for the consumer at the end of the day. That's what we're here. We need to protect the consumer and the installers. But we, it's time for change, though. I mean, I'm 50 years old. My dad's a retired gas fitter. I mean, my dad was the sort of thing, you ain't got a flame, I ain't interested. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, mate, mate, when we was kids, we used to joke, I mean, we had the gas fridge. My mum still got a gas tumble dryer, right? If, we'd, if there was such a thing as a gas TV, we would have had it. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, people said, you had a gas fridge? I went, yeah, mate. I went, really? I mean, yeah. People think I'm winding them up. I said, no, we had a gas fridge when we was kids, right? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's what I was saying. Like, and I, I'm an age 50. In my lifetime, this change is going to happen. So you've got to embrace it. Some people are scared of it now. You know what it's like when condensing boilers are coming out. Oh, they never catch on. What a complete rubbish. 
It's going to be the death of everybody. Mm. Yeah, the world's going to end. There's going to be <laughs> plague of locusts coming down Mayfair. Do you know what I mean? That's what it was getting from the older guys. Mm. And now we are, I mean, what's that? What, we're now 15 years on for the condensing market, mm. right? Like, the world doesn't end, right? People have got slightly efficient, more efficient systems in the home, but we've got, to, we've got to take this to the next level, haven't we? We've got to I'm looking forward on. to my hydrogen-ready fridge, Paul. <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't get us on hydrogen-ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 actually, we, we could do. We could. I mean, David, obviously, you, 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 you're you involved in decarbonising, uh, you know, the, the, sort of the policy around it. I mean, what are your views on hydrogen? And then I'll tell you mine. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you can tell me where I've gone wrong. So listen, I'm not. I think often, and Nathan, you're on social media a lot as well. And I think often you get this quite polarised debate where people say it's either electrification or it's hydrogen. I think for me, there's both are probably going to be needed, and hydrogen definitely has a role. So, for example, in heavy industry, as it's a great example there. And then you might sort of say, well, if I'm putting a hydrogen network around the Humber or Grangemouth, for example, are there any sort of other uses you could do there? Um, and so there's, I, can, I can understand how it could have a future outside of heavy industry. But I think the bottom line for me is that, come what may, hydrogen is not going to be here for another 10 years at least. And so the stuff that we can be doing now to decarbonise heat, whether it's heat pumps, whether it's solar thermal, whether it's the building of heat networks, etc. And so we shouldn't be waiting for hydrogen to come along and provide an answer for me. We should be getting on and decarbonising what we can, improving the energy efficiency of building stock, and then using hydrogen to decarbonise some of the higher cost stuff like industry and maybe some heavy, uh, some like public transport. Yeah, where, think, did, I, where did I go wrong, Nathan? Well, no, I think um, um, I think it definitely has a role in in in, uh, in heat networks uh, where where you've got a localized central plant room. I definitely think it's got a role. Where I think we're going wrong is thinking that we can pipe it down a grid to get to people's homes. I know they're they're upgrading the grid and what they're doing when we when we say that they're upgrading it from LCS low carbon steel to uh, MDPE medium density polyethylene. Now, what people don't mainly don't realize is hydrogen is the smallest molecule it will find a leak we use it specifically to find leaks so if i think i've got a leak on a refrigeration line i will send hydrogen down it mixed with nitrogen mm. to find that leak with sniffer detection now ev even though the the grid is being upgraded what people don't realize is the gas pipe inside your house so at mm. the moment people are have these new builds are having uh, boilers installed and uh, or, the, or they're getting uh, there's people who are in homes that are um uh, having their uh, electric storage heats changed, for instance. So they're getting a new gas system. All that gas internal copper pipe work is tested with methane to see if it leaks. It's not tested with the smallest <laughs> molecule. So all this talk about hydrogen ready boilers, you go and put a hydrogen ready boiler in, let's say we do then switch over. To hydrogen. The main grid might be okay, but all that internal copper pipe work in millions of houses has got to be retested. And trust me, a lot of it will leak because hydrogen loves to find a small little gap to leak from. So in a controlled environment, like a, a plant room for district heating systems, uh, you know, big industrial stuff, fantastic. You know, you, it, as long as it's green hydrogen, I don't, I don't, I don't want to even talk about CCS, um, but it has to be green hydrogen, but sending it down, I think it is a red herring. I think it's just uh, a red herring so we can keep the, keep the momentum of upgrading the network. Uh, mm. I, I don't think it's going to work in people's homes at all. Um, but it has a future, definitely has a future as it? I mean, as a, as a, it's got a brilliant future, I think. But yeah, not in, not in people's homes, the, the boilers. Um, going back to Ingo, what is the, what, what's the next step for the UK, do you think, in, in promoting uh, district heating that can use solar thermal as part of the energy mix? Oh. I would say definitely something like, like, like a sound subsidy program and combined with a quality management program. So that you get something like uh, support for for let's say the city to plan something in combination with uh, with the local energy providers that they've got reliability that there's funding for that that there's a support maybe not only in the financing but also maybe get external knowledge from somewhere go there are plenty of great engineers in Denmark in, in Scandinavia that can support them and get them in develop something, have a few good pilots somewhere popping up using not only solar thermal because there's no magic unicorn just passing by and then saying, I supply all your heat now. May it be hydrogen, may it be heat pump, may it be uh, your compost heap or whatever else. I think it's always a mix. And then you have to choose whatever 
is suitable for your system because if you're in the countryside you might have biomass if you are somewhere in let's say manchester birmingham there's not much green over there so you have to use what is there waste heat uh, may it be heat from the surrounding whatever else is there but, but combine it with a good subsidy program supported with expert knowledge quality management program combine it maybe with let's say what we can call it in, 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 in austria spatial energy planning so you combine your urban redevelopment with something like, like an energy dimension where do we need energy in a city where are the networks already there where's gas already around where's heat what is the heat demand in a certain spot because district heating does not really make sense if you go to the outskirts where you've got a low heat density you should go for where there's a high demand for that so uh, but, but all that in a nutshell should be there planning plus subsidy program plus um, plus the quality management because if you can say okay quality is there in terms of reliability you can afford it and it's green you've got a winner i like your idea of uh you know, exchanging information you know maybe getting sort of denmark engineers uh, visiting some of the uk engineers and some of the people involved in uh, local authorities in certain cities meeting some of the and exchange in ideas because obviously this is a global problem that we're all it's not just an isolated country it's not no, 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 no. it's a global issue it's a global solution let's put it that way everywhere you and you've got a let's say a certain heat demand and then and, and you can think about district heating of course you can also say i just use my, my pv plus my ground source or air source heat pump that also makes sense but district heating is something you should definitely not say this is something communistic back from the 1950s and forget about it this is sometimes what you really encounter if you say district heating, oh, this is something from, from, from the east, then uh, leave me alone. And uh, what, um, what's what is the oh, we we talked about about the policy, new builds. Um, yeah. Obviously, if there's big big sort of um, new builds going on or development sites going on, I mean, is it something yeah. you, you feel people are considering or the developers are considering this, this heat network? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, there's uh, all over the country. I'm aware developers are, are putting heat networks in in the ground right now. It's not just also. I'd say it's, it's not also just the new build. And just to pick up Ingo's point there, I think also we're sort of seeing a lot of within cities where they're redeveloping sites. They're thinking about either how they can extend existing heat networks or how they can re retrofit a heat network in there as part of their efforts to. Um, to decarbonize heat and just picking up on something that we were um, you were just talking about there ago i think that the for me i think the importance is to have you can have you can set your energy policy or your energy strategy at like a national level but to then devolve decision making on what yeah. works yeah. down to a local or a regional level because it's only really at the local level you can sort of see this technology we, we need electrification in this particular zone or we've got a particular dense energy use here and therefore a heat network might might operate and so i think that when you when we're thinking about planning rules and how you design those i think it's going to be important to devolve those things down to allow developers to put the heat networks in where they're appropriate i think that's, the key. But that's got to be in conjunction with building better homes isn't it so we need the house builders to build more insulated and better homes because without that start whatever we do is going to be a complete waste of time isn't it I agree with that. Yes, yeah, so everything we do, it doesn't matter whether we're talking um, uh, electrification, heat pumps or, or hydrogen, it just starts with energy efficiency. That's got to be the, the yeah. first port of call, I think. Absolutely right. Yeah. Paul, do you have to repair, do you have to go out to repair district heat systems, you know, the actual pipe work under the ground? Is, it, is that sort of starting to deteriorate in some of these systems? Well, it falls apart, mate, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, this is where I am there, it's the school on that. They've got, um, traditional old, old fashioned school, all the pipe was completely in the ground. So the next five weeks we're literally running we're repiping this whole school. So it's done mm -hmm. in the 60s. Um, it's all covered in asbestos in, in, in the pits. So we're just gonna concrete over it's gonna get left. Yeah, not my idea what they're gonna do. But um, but that's what you get. And also in the game we've been really bad at looking after these systems. Mm -hmm. Water quality zero the, the pipe was never put in properly, it wasn't painted properly, you can remember them days, the pipe didn't even come painted, did it? You had to paint it yourself. So the back of the pipe never got painted, going, going, that means you had to get your arm around the back, you got paint in your arm, so you don't want to do that, did they? So, um, I mean, you, you, you this, this is the, the problem as well, but again, isn't it? You pick up on the point of water quality, and I had some very big yeah. companies ring me up recently about water quality, because another thing I advocate is VDI 2035, 
which is the German way of maintaining good quality water to prevent corrosion. And just, just for the layperson, VDI 2035 is all about taking the, lowering the conductivity of your water. So you take out mm. the cations and your anions. And what that does is it stops uh, the electrical process of corrosion in this country. And we're probably one of the only countries that really is doing it now. We, we bung in, and when I say we bung in loads of chemicals, some of these big, big buildings in London and in the cities are having pallet loads of chemicals turn up every month to get dumped into heating systems, uh, supposedly to prevent corrosion. And as Paul knows, and as we've, we, we know in the domestic center, corrosion is a massive problem. It's why our boilers break down. It's why, one of the reasons why we sell more boilers than anywhere else in Europe, because they're breaking down quicker than anywhere else in Europe. Uh, whereas most of the other, uh, other Europeans now use VDI 2035. We've got a real, real strange thing going on. We do have the biggest, largest combi market, I'm hoping, don't we? That's what you've got. <laughs> Well, what the, what, and one of the what, what really confuses engineers is most well, most boilers are actually manufactured on the continent. Their sales aren't in the UK, so on the continent they're telling engineers you must use VDI two hundred three five standards, mm. uh, which is using resin mixed resin beds to take up. But in this country, mm. the chemical industry is so powerful; it's saying you must use chemicals, uh, <laughs> and yet chemicals went on the shelves when uh, I was born, nineteen seventy one, and we still got the same problems. So, uh, I mean, they can work, they can work, uh, but you have to use them in quite scientific ways. Uh, whereas we're now finding that maybe the way the Austrians do it, it's called something else. It's not called, it's called something else in Austria, but it's the VDI 2035 seems to be the way to go. And they're thinking about using that with district heating systems, actually. Um, because yeah, of the water problem. treatment is something that everybody's doing. It's just a standard thing that you demineralize the water before you actually put it in the system. Exactly. It's the easiest way to prevent everything and then you just fire and forget and then uh, hope you've got no corrosion. Of course you will have, but it's, you try to avoid it by, by just removing it in the beginning before you yep. feed it into the system. No, no, it's exactly right. So what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to stop it there and I'm, I'm going to join the same three guests uh, for a part two and where we'll be talking about district heat systems still. So I'd like to thank my guests, uh, Paul, David and Ingo, and we will see you shortly. Thank you very much, gentlemen.